Hello adventurers of all shapes and sizes, my name is Chance, welcome to my spellbook and thank you so much for tuning in to the second part of our race series. Uh, we did the Dragonborn like months and months and months ago and I pulled you guys and you said you wanted more and sadly I was unable to meet that just because of the workload I was already accepting from not only this channel but the three others I have humble brag by the way in any case it doesn't really matter um what does matter however is we're gonna be tackling the races um in more or less kind of chronological order from release we're gonna be starting with the core rule book and then branching out from there and uh alphabetically outside of that so what i'm thinking is do either one race or one sub race a day and we should be done relatively quickly all things considered um, a lot of it will be stuff you already know but to those new players i think it'll make learning the game a lot easier for them so without further ado let's talk about the dwarves here so dwarves are very very well represented in most fantasy genres um uh, Lord of the Rings made them really popular with Gimli. Um, even games like Skyrim kind of made the dwarves super popular, although they're not really in Skyrim. It's re really weird with the Dwemer and everything else. It doesn't really pertain to 5e, but in terms of Dungeons & Dragons as a whole, dwarves have been a staple um, for certainly longer than I've been alive, to be fair. So, a while now. Now... Let's dive into their naming conventions first and foremost. Um, if you've watched my other channel, Chance's Guide to Pathfinder 2e, you'll know I actually have some pretty strong thoughts about names. Please, for the love of all that is good in this world, make them easy to pronounce. The Dwarven names aren't too bad for this, but Elvish names, for whatever silly reason, they either sound ridiculously similar to one another or they're very hard to pronounce. I don't know. Just make it so they're easy to pronounce. That's my only rule of thumb. I got some examples here for the male names. Uh, Aldric, Alberish, Barun, Braldo, uh, uh, Brotor. Uh, and it, just strong sounding names. Um, throw, throw very clear distinct syllables in there. Very similar to the Dragonborn. Um, the female names, very similar as well, Amber, Artin, uh, Aldhild, Oddhild, jeez, I can't talk today, I do apologize, but once again, breaks down into, si into syllables very clearly, and then the clan's name for the last name, um, things like Battlehammer, Brawn Anvil, Dankel, Fireforge, Frostbeard, do, do whatever you want, make it sound cool, just easy to pronounce. Now let's take a look at some of their traits. So in terms of age, they mature at the same rate as humans, but other dwarves and other long-lived species will consider them young until they reach about the age of 50, and they live for 350 years, give or take. Needless to say, they're one of the more long-lived races in uh, in D&D and in, in most fantasy genres as well. You can really play this into your character. What this lets you do is it lets you have a character that has a very long lifespan and a huge breadth of knowledge, but is still capable of going through the... Um, kind of aches and pains associated with adventuring with relatively little problems so the age really isn't a huge constraint unless you're playing a 349 year dwarf and i'm sure there's a lot of role play opportunity that comes with that however i haven't seen it happen and i've played in quite a few games so i don't know if you want to go for it uh let me know how it goes down beneath i'm always curious about that kind of stuff but yeah in terms of size between four and five feet tall and they're an average of about 150 pounds and your size is considered medium uh, It's pretty well known dwarves are short and stocky not super surprising I suppose you could increase that weight by however much you wanted um, Kind of like what they did with the Hobbit trilogy. I forget the one dwarf's name but he's, he's quite large so you could do something like that I suppose and alignment, I debated putting this in. I'm gonna roll with it just because the book mentions it, but uh, alignment is an optional rule. You don't have to use it, uh, but this kind of makes sense. 
So uh, dwarves are most most dwarves are lawful, believing uh, firmly in the benefits of a well-ordered society, and they tend towards good as well. Um, the order part for me makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you look at how most dwarven societies are depicted. The dwarfs are primarily craftsmen, and they size each other up, not just based off of the breadth of their experience, but on the quality of their craft as well. So that kind of society, with that kind of um, well-ordered, almost meritocracy in more senses than not, it, make, it makes sense that they would be lawful as a direct result of that. In terms of the tending towards good, I feel like dwarves would have an inclination to be greedy, um, very similar to the Lord of the Rings and the Belrog, right? Um, they dug too deep and they discovered something that probably you shouldn't have. Uh, so you might want to play that in your character as well. However, I feel like your background would be a far better place to source that kind of backstory and that kind of a character defect. But ultimately it is of course your choice as the creator. Now let's take a look at some mechanics here. So the dwarves get a plus two to constitution, which is absolutely great. There really isn't a reason to not want constitution. Um, casters really benefit from it because it goes a long way towards concentration. And of course, your martial classes really benefit it, really benefit from it. Um, just due to the fact that it increases their total health pool and uh, helps them out with a lot of saves, right? Uh, their speed is 25 feet, and that is walking, of course. And a lot of people look down on that. Anything less than 30 feet is kind of viewed as suboptimal, and there's a little bit of truth to that. You can bridge that gap pretty quickly with uh, a few class features and even a couple feats as well. However, the cool thing about the Dwarven movement is that it is not reduced by heavy armor. So if the armor has a, um, has a number attached to it in terms of the strength you need, whether it's 13, 16, whatever, and you don it without having that uh, strength requirement, there's a movement penalty imposed on you. If memory serves, it's 10 feet, which is honestly something I personally always forget about. Uh, reason being, I don't play a lot of martial classes, like, at all. I'm almost strictly a spellcaster, um, that's why I started the channel in the first place, but um, regardless, it's really cool that they don't have to worry about that, so you could potentially wear some armor you probably shouldn't be able to. There would be more than likely some other downsides to doing that, but it is possible, and it's really interesting that they get that. Um, in terms of languages, uh, you have the ability to speak, read, and write common and dwarvish, which makes sense. Uh, you do have dark vision as well, which once again makes a lot of sense. Uh, most depictions of dwarves have them mining or living within mountains, things of that nature, so it makes sense that they'd adapt. So it's up to 60 feet. Uh, you see uh, dim light as if it was bright light and darkness as if it was dim light. Now, if you're looking in darkness, however, you can't see colors. You can only see in black and white. Usually it doesn't factor into the game, but it's still worth bringing up just in case the DM has a puzzle involving colors. Um, but let's take a look at their other traits, and they do have a few, and I have something to bring up about one of them in particular, but let's dive into it. So first off, we have Dwarven Resistance, which gives them advantage on saves against poison and resistance against poison damage. This is super useful, especially early on in the campaign. You'll see a lot of beasts in particular, namely the insects. Um, they, do, they almost all do poison damage, and even some of the rats will inflict the poison condition on you. So it's really good to be able to deal with that and it might help improve your tankiness and overall survivability. Now you also get access to Dwarven combat training, so you have proficiency with the battle axe, hand axe, light hammer, and the war hammer. And this is regardless of which class you go with. So even if you're playing a caster and for whatever reason you run out of spell slots or spells aren't super effective against something, you do have an extra set of abilities to fall back on just in case. 
under tool proficiency, you get to pick a proficiency with smithing tools, brewer supplies, or mason tools. Now, in terms of which one's better than the other, it honestly all depends on your campaign, all depends on the DM, and all depends on just your character in general. However, personally, I find smith tools are always a solid bet for the martial classes, and maybe mason tools for the sneakier builds like assassins for example. Uh, if you can remove a keystone from a bridge or something along those lines calling, causing it to collapse, that'd be a pretty cool use for it. Under brewer supplies, bard's the first thing that comes to mind just because, you know, alcohol and all that good stuff. Um, and it, along the alcohol concept, you can really play into over consuming because you have advantage on those poison saves, right? And you have a boost to con, which is really nice too. So it'll put you at a little bit of an advantage should you find yourself in a drinking contest. However, my favorite trait the dwarves get, and the one I see almost no one uses, which is just baffling to me because there's so many cool opportunities for it. Uh, it's it's stone cunning. Haven't heard of it? Ran over it? Probably. It's not one I see actively discussed a whole lot. It's one I like to play into though, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. So if you're unfamiliar, stone cunning, whenever you make a history check regarding to really anything stone related, you have double proficiency with it. So if you're just starting out, your proficiency bonus is two, and then you just double it. It basically gives you expertise in it. Which is really cool, because it makes you roll a lot higher, obviously. But when are you going to need to look into stonework, you know? If you're tracking something in a dungeon or in a castle, or you're trying to detect traps in stone walls, or anything along those lines, this is super applicable for. I really like it. I have one campaign that involves... Um, a demon kind of living within the walls and someone made a stone cunning check regarding that and I basically revealed the, the BBEG kind of technically and they didn't really pick up on my hints but I I was about as clear as I could have been without outright saying there's a demon living in these walls you know like I described how the stones have slight traces of sulfur and show signs of charring and decaying and stuff like that but they didn't really pick up on it I don't know Adventures League is a weird place guys that being said that's about it for the dwarves now let me give you my personal thoughts before I let you go here so it's going to be worth noting outright the dwarves have access to one of the cooler feats in the game uh, it's called dwarven fortitude so i ha have a video explaining it in the feat series i can't remember what number it is but it's it, it is in there trust me so it increases your constitution score by one and whenever you take the dodge action you can use a hit die to heal yourself which if you factor in the out of combat implications of that where you can just take the dodge action on repeat basically you can heal yourself completely without even taking a short rest that feat with a with a barbarian they also have access to a unique barbarian subclass um, but I don't know I've never met anyone who's taken it sadly I think I had a Buddy who played with a gentleman in a one shot but it's called path of the battle rager it's got some really cool stuff check out the barbarian playlist for that but overall they're just cool they're cool they're fun to play as they're one of the most popular choices uh, in 5e and with good reason they have a lot of benefits and really no downsides you can make an argument that their speed isn't all that great and you can make an argument that they're kind of plain but, you know, they got a lot of interesting implications for them. That being said, let me know what you think of the dwarves down beneath in the comment section. And because I know you're going to ask, in terms of what classes work best with them, honestly, almost all of them would be fine. They, they just have a plus two constitution, right? So it's not like there's any class in particular that wouldn't benefit from constitution, you know? I mean, maybe if you were playing a ranged character, you wouldn't need an abundance of constitution. So, 
Yeah, but even, I don't know, it's, it's all kind of up to interpretation, I suppose, and play style, but overall, they'll work fine with just about anything. But that being said, if you disagree, let me know down beneath in the comments section. Also mention any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, or uh, just cool stories you have involving your dwarf. That being said, I hope you have a wonderful day, and before I let you go, feel free to use code WELCOME over at the guild hall to get a free one shot. Uh, we got a couple up there now, more going up fairly regularly. I think they're all pretty neat, the Adventures League crowd seems to like them, so let me know what you think. Yeah, it'd be really sweet guys, thanks. Um, but yeah, I will see you all later, and of course, happy adventuring everyone.